Welcome, everyone, to the all-new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. And Chris in South London. Chris, welcome. It's July. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it's July, and we have much excitement. Whilst kind of Doctor Who is is, is going to be going away from our screens, alas, um, we have a, a weighty tome to um, to discuss in, in, in this month's club. And uh, yeah, so th- there, there, is, there is much joy and much stuff. There is, and in, uh, in the sweltering July heat, we have the uh, coldness of space and the uh, <laughs> the wheel of ice by Stephen Baxter yes. uh, for this month's selection. Let's talk about our uh, show and tell for the yeah. month. What do you have this month for us, Chris? Two things that are primarily going to be of interest to people in the or accessible to people in the London area. So apologies uh, for people that are not from London. The the various London boroughs uh, are all supposed to do their own thing when it comes to libraries. And then they've realized that this is quite sort of costly. And so they've been merging their audio and the E kind of archives uh, which now means that if you're lucky enough to live in a London borough and if it's part of the London Borough cons- Consortium, which I think is most of the London boroughs are part of the Library Consortium thing, you have got a large supply of big Finnish audios you can listen to for free. Oh. Yeah. So you can download them onto uh, onto your mobile, listen to them for, via a free app, and uh, all you have to do is go and present yourself at a local library and get a library card if you don't have one already. So, uh, big tip if you live in London, you don't even need to. If you live in if you work in London, quite often the boroughs let you join. Uh, if, if as long as you can show proof that you're working within that borough. Yeah, that, that's really cool. They've got decent selection as well. I mean, they've got. Um, quite a few of the Unbound, um, quite a bit of the Paul McGann stuff, uh, some of the Tom Baker ones, and I, I haven't checked it for a kind of like a couple of weeks. I know they were they've been adding some more audio generally across the board, so that that's really cool. The other thing I was going to say was in October in Epsom Theatre, which is sort of uh, well, the Epsom Playhouse, actually. And so Epsom is a kind of small village that's been kind of absorbed by London. Uh, they are doing a a night of Doctor Who ness, and I'm trying to remember who is who's there. It's not telling me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, sorry, I should have looked ahead on this. But yeah, who's at the Playhouse is the name of it. It's first of October. I've got nothing to do with this, so uh, so this 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 is just a this is a <laughs> this isn't a, a plug that I'll benefit from. Uh, the headliners are. Uh, one Mr. Colin Baker and one Mr. Peter Davison. Ooh, that'll be yeah. nice. Yeah, so tickets 45 quid and it's a whole day event on Sunday the 1st of October. And it looks like tickets are still available. So they've also got Louise Jameson, John Leeson, Michael Keating, Prentice Hancock. Basically, we're going quite 70s and 80s, with, obviously, with Davison and Baker. Yeah, it's, it's, and apparently you get a free autograph from each guest on the celebrity autograph panel. Oh, that's with how much they charge at conventions for autographs. That that might be worth the price of admission. Oh, with the caveat of that doesn't include the special guest celebrities, oh. <laughs> and then they list the big ones on that list. Oh, that's sneaky. But anyway, you, you can go and have a little look and stuff. So um, yeah, Epsom Playhouse, Sunday the first of October. I haven't worked out why I'm doing that weekend. Uh, if you go along, I think there's a fair chance you might see me there. Very cool. Hmm. Yeah, if, if I was in London, I would definitely uh, try to attend. Yeah, that. yeah, it's cool because uh, I've, whilst I have seen Peter Davidson and Colin Baker speak, I've not actually kind of um, met them. Uh, so uh, that would be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. So what do you have? Sure. So this month, it's more of a tell than a show. Um, <laughs> last weekend was uh, my husband and I's uh, wedding reception. Oh, cool. 
Yeah, we had gotten married uh, just about two years ago after Mm -hmm. the uh, court case went through in the States because we didn't know how long, you know, act now Mm. while it's available sort of thing. Yes. And it took us, you know, a couple years to uh, build up the motivation and uh, finances to throw a good party. So Mm. that's what we ended up doing. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun. It was about 100 guests or so. And it had a kind of a Doctor Who slash sci-fi theme. And it was both our two-year wedding anniversary and then also our 10-year anniversary of meeting. So that was kind of nice. We uh, entered to uh, I Am the Doctor in Utah (laughs) by Murray Gold (laughs) playing. And uh, we didn't wear bow ties, so at least, but uh, Uh, we had regular ties. We had like a photo booth with um, props from the show, like the different sonic screwdrivers and scarves. And our centerpieces, you know, were the normal flowers. But then each table was either a um, time ship, space station, or starship. So (laughs) (laughs) depending, so you had like table deep space nine and the the models in the middle of each table. Mm -hmm. Um, But it ended up looking really cool. It was funny. It was afterwards and there were people sharing pictures from you know all the all the different centerpieces and then different people commenting like hey i think a couple of my friends who don't know each other are are at the same wedding (laughs) because (laughs) they're they're seeing you know pictures coming up on different feeds and like oh yeah so and so's at this table tables next to you so that was kind of um funny to see happen but it was it was a lot of fun convention planning definitely helped prepare me for Mm. For, wedding plan yeah <laughs> but it, it also feels very very good to be on the other end of that as well so it feels like the rest of my summer is open and free <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's so good. yeah it was a it was a lot of fun but it, a little bit of work too but it was yeah. good for our wedding uh, we tried to hire a tardis uh but uh, alas we couldn't uh, we, we, we we couldn't persuade them to kind of ship it down however the village we got married in is next door to the village that tom baker lives in Oh. I, I didn't pop round for tea. Uh, I was kind of like busy with other things. I, I thought that was kind of cool because um, the um, at the because we got married in a pub um, in a very British way, uh, and we were taught by some of the bar staff when they realised that there might be a little bit of a, a Doctor Who connection. Uh, they said, "Yeah, you know, he pops in here from time to time." I was like, <laughs> "Oh, okay," <laughs> but uh, alas, he didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, that would have so. been. That would have been great. Uh, that would have been a bit freaky, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of nervous enough as it is about a random cameo by Tom Baker at my wedding. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, cool, cool. Well, well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So shall we uh, get into this, this book, The Wheel of Ice? Yes, yes, that's us. I don't know a whole lot about Stephen Baxter. This was the first book of his that I read. Have you read any of his other work? I've read some of his other work, uh, including a book called Titan, which is largely set on Titan. (laughs) So, yeah, he didn't have to do a lot of extra research. I think this was his only Doctor Who book he's done as well. Yes, kind of, because he did write a short story for um, one of the big Finnish short story collections. Um, The ones that started out as uh, Virgin, sorry, I said big Finnish, I meant Virgin, um, Virgin's um, sort of short story compilations. So by the time they'd become um, sort of Benny New Adventure compilations rather than Doctor Who ones, he wrote a short story in one of those um, in volume four, if I believe rightly. Is that the uh, Decalogue series? Yes, that's that's the that's the word that was um, escaping from my brain. Of his stuff that's got nothing to do with the Doctor Who universe, uh, I've read the NASA trilogy, which is a kind of like an alternative history uh, that starts off with um, JFK narrowly surviving assassination and kind of driving NASA forward to kind of go and explore Mars and uh, Titan and things. So that's that's a decent enough. I've read some of his other stuff that I found a bit, um, I found a little bit characterless, but because uh, I also read, he did a collaboration with the late great uh, Sir Terry Pratchett called, uh, I think it was called The Long Earth. It was about a series of planet Earths that you could kind of like, jump from one dimension to another. And it was the idea was how would man behave if there was no shortage of kind of land and resource? Hmm. Is an interesting idea. I'm not quite so sure how easy it stretches to a yeah, five-volume series. Uh, to be fair, I've only kind of listened to volume two, 
um, because that was all that was available and I needed something to listen to whilst doing a long drive. Um, but um, and if there was decent radio signal where I was, I might have stopped listening. So um, so, so a, a mixed relationship with Mr. Baxter. But uh, but I, I did particularly enjoy, I think Voyage or Voyager is the first one of the um of the NASA trilogy and Moon Seed, which is um, the the last bit of the NASA trilogy, which is a giant disaster movie set in Edinburgh and other parts, and, uh, and it evolves around uh, Apollo eighteen, uh, which in real life didn't happen, but in, in his universe it did happen, and it brought back some bad stuff that causes problems. Um, yeah, it's 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 really cool. If people have enjoyed uh, this particular foray into Stephen Baxter. I, I think the NASA trilogy is a good a, a good spot. Um because he's also done um so sort of, yeah he, he has quite a few other series as, as well. Strangely he's never been nominated for a Hugo. He's one of these guys who's just been bouncing around for some time where he's not been nominated for a Hugo for novels. He's been nominated for short stories. And also despite what you might expect given some of the things in the story, he's not Scottish. Hmm. Uh because uh, I checked on that because I was going for is he yet another one of these um, these fantastic Scottish science fiction writers? Like, no, no, he's from Liverpool. But because uh, uh, spoilers, this gets very Scottish. Does this book? It does. Yeah. <laughs> Unexpectedly so for a book set uh, around Saturn. <laughs> it, I should mention it's structured very interestingly. It's uh, got a whole bunch of like interludes and a really high. Mm chapter count that there's almost 50 chapters and i i do appreciate the shorter chapters it make it does make you feel like you're making more progress as you're <laughs> as you're reading through yeah. it so it it starts off with a a prologue mm. about um a, a consciousness called archive which from what we can gather has been frozen at the center of a um moon for for several billion years mm -hmm. And it predates the origin of our own solar system. So if there's and there's going to be lots of uh, space talk. <laughs> oh yeah. In, in this in this <laughs> one, lots of lots of astronomy and <laughs> yes, different things brought in. Yeah. But uh, this moon, um, which is called uh, Nemocene, mm -hmm. uh, which is there's the whole story there just in in the name of the moon. Um, Nemocene is. Uh, one of the titans that was associated with uh, Saturn mm. and uh, is kind of a... a in a, mythology, uh, just to make it clear, yeah. Yeah, in, in mythology, sorry. Yeah. And it, it was is a fictional name that's been used in a lot of different science fiction series to refer to an extra moon around Saturn. So mm. I think uh, Baxter probably picked that deliberately is like an homage to some of those earlier uh, stories. Mm. Our archive is this consciousness that survived from five billion years ago or so, mm. uh, is eventually found itself orbiting um, Saturn, mm. and something like 50 million years ago caused the uh, moon that it was at the center of to explode, mm. forming um, Saturn's rings. Yes. And that same event, it sent a, a little parcel or package backwards in time. More about that later. Yes, because she somehow managed to detect a primitive intelligence on the Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and, and we also see as well at this point, um, three words, which I think is the three words that the book begins with, which is resilience, remembrance, and restoration. And uh, we will encounter those those words a few times as we kind of go through um yeah and so she she's she's got in in her she's got the memories of the civilization that that made her uh but she knows that she's broken uh and if she but she can't be fixed she wants to return to home with a capital h uh so uh, yeah yeah it's, it's 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 quite a cool enigmatic start isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. or maybe not enigmatic but yeah it's, it's a good start Reminds me a little bit of the Star Trek Next Generation episode, The Inner Light, where you have the mm. probe from the long lost civilization with the memories and arts and culture of, of the previous civilization mm. kind of locked away within it. Kind of evoked similar comparison for me. Yeah. Uh, so then the TARDIS arrives mm. and we're jumping ahead to, I want to say, the latter half of the 21st century. Yes. Now, here's an interesting game. Date this. 
Mm. When does this happen? <laughs> I mean, I think we'll, we'll go into more details probably on this as we kind of go through, because there's a lot of two things that make it quite tricky. But it's, it's, it's before Zoe's time. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Cause... I, thought, I thought you meant date this in terms of the doctor, in terms of where it falls in season six, because ah. that's equally that's equally problematic. Yes. And, yeah. and we might get to that. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I have a slight theory on that one as well. But yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, so what, what we can share is that the, it is the Doctor, Jamie, and Zoe. Yes. At some at some point during season six, and also Zoe has an open pixie like face, um, which reminds me of that rather gassy description of the Fifth Doctor having an open face. It always sounded it's like slightly horrific. The open pleasant face yes. of uh, Peter Davison. Yes. yes. It's like, it sounds gory, uh, not pleasant. Uh, and she's also reading Brave New World, which I imagine is a authorial doff of the hat to um, to Aldous Huxley. Uh, mm-hmm. So, uh, and the TARDIS is trying to land, having detected a relative continuum displacement zone. Uh, so, in other words, a bit of timey wimeyness, uh, as uh, as our later, later Doctor would say. It materialized where it thought that a moon was supposed to be, but <clears throat> it was it really uh, gets caught in what are spokes of Saturn's rings, mm. and I had to look these up because I wasn't sure if they were real or not, but <laughs> th- they're a real thing. Mm. So within the rings of Saturn, there are different vibrational patterns and really quite beautiful looking um, spokes that are created uh, every once in a while due to kind of the, the gravitational forces within the Saturn system itself. Mm. And the TARDIS materializes in one of these, it's almost like an eddy where it's getting buffeted around and getting mm. slammed by uh, different shards of ice and mm. ice crystals. And they're observed by, uh, I want to say she's like a 16-year-old girl, yeah. a young woman uh, named Fee, mm-hmm. P H E E. Yeah. And and Fee is is kind of watching this from watching the TARDIS having difficulties in the rings. Mm. And I want to say she's on the space scooter. At she this is. Point. She is. She she's kind of cutting a bit of a silver surfer kind of vibe. Um and she's also accompanied by her robot, uh, Mac, uh, that uh, speaks in a Glaswegian dialect, uh which and it's written in Glaswegian as well. So uh, so you, you have to kind of sometimes a bit phonetically, so you're just having to kind of like sort of parse it in your brain. And Mac is this robot that's pretty large. I think it was, mm. he was described as something like 10 meters across and has hatchways and access ports. So I'm thinking it's, you know, 30 to 40 feet across. And it's kind of a, um, with, with the hatchways, I, would, I think you could almost climb inside of it. It's it's that large and it's kind mm. of looks like a spider. It has all these limbs coming off it that have different tools and attachments. And um, we don't, know this at the time but we later learned that he this robot mac is has an artificial intelligence and really built the uh space station that's surrounding Mm -hmm. the fragment of what was the once much larger uh moon of saturn that became its rings but is now this little um rock of ice called Mm -hmm. nemocene Mm -hmm. and uh i the the imagery too just the you know the girl on the the scooter kind of surfing the rings of saturn with her large robot kind of following behind mm. really reminded me of almost like a something you'd get out of like a miyazaki or studio ghibli mm. sort of movie it's a striking image yeah it really is so yeah so kind of back on the tardis uh, they're trying to kind of dodge the incoming ice boulders and it turns out that the doctors disabled the tardis's automated defense system so you can repair it which is a bit because you're kind of like didn't the dominators teach him a lesson about kind of bad stuff and tardises and whatnot but yeah uh and so just about to be hit by a particularly large boulder uh, that boulder suddenly mysteriously explodes as the, another one and uh, and uh, mac has uh, has arrived to kind of rescue them and uh, he kind of gives them a salute with his arms uh and uh, then they start kind of communicating and uh, he and jamie have a kind of like a scottish off um, mm-hmm. <laughs> we we get a kind of a cool scene too where it's mm-hmm. the uh almost like the old series coming in contact with the new series where mm. we've we've had the 
the scene before with the second doctor where um, I think it's at the end of the enemy of the world where he opens the ship doors and it, you know, creates a vacuum and all mm. the air starts sucking out and they do that. They go to do the same thing here so that Mac can tie a um, rope around the TARDIS console. So, so you can basically tow them to safety mm. out of the, out of the ring system. And Jamie and Zoe have a little bit of a freak out that the doctor's going to be opening the doors, but <laughs> he does it new series style <laughs> and it, and extends the atmosphere out so that it's not a problem. And you get this cool moment where Jamie and Zoe and the doctor are all standing at the entrance of the TARDIS looking out at Saturn and the rings and really cool moment that you probably wouldn't have been able to get in the classic series, just, you know, given... <laughs> Not budget. only budget budget constraints, but they that the TARDIS doors didn't work that way back. Yeah, then. it it would be very hard to imagine this. I mean, without watching the kind of scoot too far, there's quite a few scenes of this that just would not have been possible during um, Troughton's era for just general kind of you know budgetary and and technology reasons. But yeah, so cool nonetheless. The space scooter reminded me too quite a bit of um, the Rings of Akatan. The, oh, yeah, the little scooter in that. Yeah, I try not to think of the Rings of Akaten, but yes, yes, you're right. It's a bit Rings, it's a bit Rings of Akaten. Uh, but... I try to not as well. But... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Apologies if you're a big fan of the Rings of Akaten, uh, but uh, you're wrong. Uh, anyway, so so yeah, we see we see Fee um, kind of um, arrive, and she's quite surprised that she can breathe the air in the TARDIS and stuff, and and uh, she introduces herself and and sort of says that her mum Joe is the mayor on the wheel, uh, and uh, we we also start getting an insight into their kind of their the the kind of class system that operates on the wheel where there are people of varying classifications um uh, where kind of class a are kind of like the highest earners uh, or the most intelligent and uh, uh, and you have kind of class b and so fee is a class a and her mum despite the fact that she's mayor is a class b so uh, we will find more about the classification system later we also learn a little bit about how the colony's organized and how there are six sections to it. Mm. And the wheel is tethered to the moon with different cables that yeah. run along tracks. And it was somewhat kind of built organically. So you have different sections that are cobbled together with different bits of spaceship from mm. all sorts of different eras uh, leading up to, to this. And I want to say it's probably at least 15 to 20 years before Zoe's time, mm. if not. Um, yeah, we don't get a firm date as to when it's set, but it, I, I would say probably 2050 or later. I didn't realize Zoe was from the latter half of the 21st century as well. For some reason, I always thought The Wheel in Space was set more like in Vicky or Stevens' time frame, mm. where she's thousands of years ahead of... I had to, Once I read that, I... I went to wikipedia and i was like Are, is steven baxter right about this and, <laughs> you know it's kind of fact checking him and and sure enough it, it was uh i always pictured zoe as being i guess more intelligent and being farther along the humanity's future timeline i guess well i mean she was I mean, when she was created i mean they were talking about a time that was 130 years or so in the future so uh i guess it would have seemed quite far, you know futuristic but for us now it's uh, you know it's only uh 80 years or so ahead <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh but yeah it we, we get a lot of good contrast mm. with zoe kind of because in her time things aren't quite as um rustic shall we say there it's a little bit more refined and it's not quite as corporate driven mm. we get the we get a couple references in this book to the fact that the the colonists have to pay for their their own air mm. not un, not unlike um, <laughs> what we just saw this season in um oxygen yeah yeah um, so before before we kind of leave the tardis scene it's also worth noting that um so zoe spots a console indicator kind of going bananas um uh, and it's suggesting that there's there's a presence of Petleron particles, uh, which apparently is something that indicates a device that has traveled through time, and uh, and so there's so there's something has come in with Fee, it would appear, 
uh, that uh, that has time traveled. You'd have thought that the Petron particle indicator would be kind of like going off on a fairly regular basis yeah. anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. So uh, anyway, we, we yes, make a mental note of that. <laughs> and we should also mention too that the TARDIS won't let them leave mm. until the relative continuum displacement zone is resolved. So they're not going to be able to use the TARDIS for any sorts of, well, they, back then they couldn't really do short hops anyway, but mm. it's pretty much out of commission for the entire story, more yeah. or less. Yeah. The Doctor and Jamie and Zoe kind of integrate with the colonists around the wheel mm. um, a little bit. They end up staying with uh, the mayor's family, Joe's family, mm-hmm. and, they, and Zoe uh, sees... At one point, as they're kind of getting a tour of the space station, she sees a what looks like a little blue, perhaps a kid or a really mm. short adult running by really fast out of the corner of her eye. And she asks what that was, and the other colonists kind of ignore her, or mm. don't talk about it. Yeah. So she's somewhat suspicious. Fee's uh, youngest, uh, Fee's little sister sees it uh, and sort of shouts blue doll, uh, which kind of suggests that, um, that it's, it's, it's not a victim's imagination. There's, we also have around about this time, um, there's a kind of a council meeting that's happening with the Wheel of Ice. Uh, and so we're kind of, we're, we're introduced to a few of the kind of the main players so we've got um, um, the Mayor Joe, who's the only elected member of the council. The medical officer, Dr. Sinbad Omar. Um, Marshal Sonia Paley from International Space Command. Is that a thing in the Wheel of Space, International Space Command? It sounds like something that would have been from that, that era of the show. Funnily enough, I went back and watched The Tenth Planet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sure enough, the... International Space Command is the uh, is the organization in the Tenth Planet, so uh-huh. they've been around at least since 1986. <laughs> yes, yes. Also on the council, we've got um, Louis Rays uh, from uh, Planetary Ethics, and uh, last and by no means least is uh, is a lady called Florian Hart, who represents Bootstrap Incorporated. It's a mining firm that's operating on the moon. Uh, so, which one of those do you think is going to be a villain? Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and so Florian's giving him a lecture about how um, banalium mining is giving him an important rocket fuel. Uh, and uh, it, we're also told that there's kind of, we're told a bit about how gravity works, that there's kind of gravity on the wheel, a slightly lower gravity than what we're used to on Earth. Uh, but that's kind of, that's, that's created by how fast the wheel is spinning. And on the moon itself, there's a lower gravity uh, even. And uh, as Joe, the mayor, is wheelchair bound, is um, um, following uh, kind of an IED incident in Venezuela. And uh, her disability um, doesn't affect her when she's on the moon. It's only up when she's up on the wheel. Uh, so, uh, and... Uh, but also in this particular scene, we do have some info dumpy bits. Is uh, there's a few bits of dialogue that sort of, as you know, and then characters explain to each other things they already know about um, uh, how the asteroids uh, are kind of kept away from the wheel and uh, stuff. Which are, I don't know, I found a bit clunky. And, and there's uh, a few bits about the class structure. So again, so the people are evaluated by tests. And their house according to their status it doesn't sound like a nice place to live yeah it, it is definitely rough and on the frontier and is evocative of some of those kind of early sci-fi kind of more hard sci-fi mm. um, stories where you have to worry about dust and you have to worry about oxygen and and all those it, it's a little bit more gritty than some of the later space adventures the uh the reference to Bernalium, the the mineral that they're mining, yeah. that was also the same um, element that was in uh, the wheel in space. So ah. Zoe's first story, it was uh, her space station. It was the element that was used to power the uh, X ray laser on on that station. So okay. uh, kind of a callback there. Mm. Um, I did appreciate that how of the council of five people or so that three out of the five were women mm. and the three most powerful positions. So Florian's um, 
Joe's and then Some, the security yeah. yeah the security chief were all um female characters so that was that was kind of nice to mm. to see that because you I think in a lot of dramas or novels it probably wouldn't turn out that way so yeah. this brings us to our dramatic reading for the month where we pick up on a conversation that the doctor and Zoe are having about early space travel and they kind of get into a conversation about free will a little <laughs> bit too um and this is from the audio which is read by david troughton uh son of patrick troughton who i want to say was david troughton in uh midnight and curse of paladon yep, yep. Yeah, he's done quite a bit of sort of readings uh, uh for uh, on, on his dad's behalf not to be confused with michael troughton who was also in doctor who in um Last Christmas, I think, was the story he was. Uh, in. One of those two, and I can't remember which one it is, uh, has a ha- has a son who's played cricket for England. Oh, huh. Uh, and no relation to the female Troughton, whose name first name I forget, who's directed some of the the modern series that has no connection to the Troughton family, as far as I'm aware. Alice Troughton. Yes, I think. that's it. Yep. Yes, yes. Yep. That's it. Anyway. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> So he leaned towards the doctor. Have you heard of bootstrap ink before? In various contexts, yes. Met the chap who founded it, actually. Not a bad fellow. Let his ambitions run away with him, though. This isn't a happy place. I'd say not, Zoe. A society where children's whole lives are being sacrificed to the goals of their parents. The parents had a choice about coming out here, living like this, The children had none at all. These are the first generations to live away from the earth, Zoe. You're meeting some of the first children, like Sam and Fee and little Casey, ever to have been born away from the mother world. Born in boxes of metal or plastic or ceramic, where you have to buy every molecule of air you breathe. These, Zoe, are the first human beings ever to have been born in cages, No wonder there is conflict, then. Quite. But, Zoe, it's nothing to do with us. All we are concerned about is the relative continuum displacement zone. He glanced up at the moon. I rather think I need to take a look at what's really going on up there in the mine, and have something of a route around down here. I saw it too, you know, he murmured. Saw what? Casey's blue doll. He tapped his nose. Now, if we saw it, despite having just arrived here, it's clearly a real phenomenon. Something that can be objectively confirmed. So why the denial? Why the mystery? Is somebody running a cover-up? And what's the significance of the blue dolls anyhow? I've no idea what's going on here, not yet. But everything's connected, Zoe. The social tension, this funny business with the blue dolls, the time anomaly. Everything's connected. It always is. All you have to do is pull on a thread and the rest unravels. This sounded a bit pompous to Zoe and irritated her. What about Jamie and me? What threads shall we pull on? The girl fee laws is somehow central to this. The time travel artifact that may be in her possession. Jamie's rather hit it off with the brother, I think, and you with Fee. I suggest you stick close to the youngsters. In this place, Zoe didn't feel young at all. She, too, had been born and raised in confined extraterrestrial environments. She ought to be used to this, but part of her longed to be away from this wheel of ice. I think I'd rather go chase another dangling thread. I want to speak to Mac again, that spider robot. He must know all about this place. Oh, yes, that sounds worthwhile to me. I hadn't thought of it. His tone was so gentle, she couldn't tell if he was being sincere or just being kind. At this point, we get a little bit of a another one of those interludes. Um, this time, we get the backstory of Mac, the... Uh, the robot mm. and kind of how he built the station. 
Um, we learn a little bit about uh, the AI ethics laws that have come into play, mm -hmm. which is interesting because they, they gave him a consciousness, uh, which is which helped him in it. And he thought for a long time, we get these flashbacks that he, he thought he was a little boy on Earth with a father and a mother, but it turns out he was just a suitcase <laughs> that was <laughs> being carried around these places and uh, kind of a sad um, backstory. And but it was it was nice to to get that. I think. Yeah, he he's he's amazingly upbeat given <laughs> given that he all he wants to do is be a real boy. Yeah, uh, it, it, it was a bit odd. I, mean, I was like, like why do you go to so much trouble of kind of persuading them to be? Yeah, that, that, that he's a little kid. It does seem a little. It seems cruel. Um, but uh, though this doesn't necessarily, uh, yeah, this time period doesn't seem to be kind of like big on compassion. Um, so we've got so um, we've got the TARDIS crew now, kind of uh, sort of living at uh, at Joe and Fee's house, and uh, we've noticed as well that Fee is wearing an amulet, and Zoe reckons that this is the time traveling artifact. Which does seem to be a big conclusion for us to jump to, but um, but yeah, we're also uh, introduced to her brother Sam, who is he's basically an unreconstructed teenager, isn't he? I mean, he's got kind of dim lights, loud music, calls Jamie granddad. They're having to do a room share. It's it's it's, yeah. it, it's something, I guess. The doctor tells Jamie to keep an eye on Fee, yes, and to keep an eye on the amulet as mm. well, so mm -hmm. that it kind of separates Jamie off from the doctor and Zoe for much of the story. It does get, it does it in a, I think kind of a natural way where he has his own mission and it's not by circumstance. He's, he's choosing to get involved with Sam and Fee and some of their friends. And... Yeah. So before we kind of go sort of too far on, 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 on some of their adventures, the, the youngest daughter, Casey, uh, she's got a blue doll that she found uh, that is kind of being kept almost as a plaything in their bed. Uh, and which is uh, obviously, it was a bit weird. Fee uh, is kind of, she's also hearing these reports of there being attacks and uh, she reads some testimony from how a 16 year old girl in, sort of reads testimony of, of a kind of like a violent attack. I don't know. It's kind of like somebody read, yeah, you know, 16 year old kid reading a police report uh, nowadays. But then again, her mum's the mayor. She finds out there's um, this guy whose flesh started turning blue, having been attacked by a doll. Uh, and so she goes to kind of examine Casey's doll and then the mouth opens like a slit, revealing needle-like teeth, and it tries to grab her pendant, and she manages to fight it off. Yeah, so the dolls are weird and creepy. <laughs> yeah, very, very much. And yeah. they're, the doll is about the same size and height as Casey, the youngest kid, so it's mm. um, quite a large doll, I guess, that, that comes alive, too. They, they aren't um, super tiny, like, action figures or anything like that. No they in terms of like how she how fee found out about the the report they they made some mention that joe her mother was um really paranoid about communications oh, and yes. electronics so she she did, did hard printouts of everything and kept them in a desk in her, a desk drawer <laughs> oh yes <laughs> that, yes i forgot about that which which seems totally 60s like you could see you know pulling open the file drawer and tossing out the folder and paging through it and oh look here's a here's a police report but uh, yeah it, it seemed a little um odd that they wouldn't just do that all electronically or that they'd even have paper yeah. in space to to do that with but um or that she'd have a secure office yeah so if, if she has to have it printed out for some reason <laughs> we learn a little bit more about the social structure mm. on the wheel and we find out that there's in addition to a and b grade there's c grade which i think sam has fallen into in terms mm. of where he placed in his um, aptitude tests, yeah. But that there's also a D grade, which is like a punishment or um, people who are jailed or suspected of crimes. Mm. They they have the absolute like worst of the worst jobs, but it is very much like a class system mm. uh, present. There. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Sam is kind of like he's very proud of being C. He he's he's kind of sort of rebelling against his his upbringing. Yeah, so keep 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 an eye on Sam and his rebellion uh, as we go through. <laughs> I was gonna say they're uh, at this point. Speaking of the rebellion, um, mm. Fee and Sam decide to take off 
mm. and go to Enceladus to go skiing. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Jamie decides to accompany them, and about um, 15 or 16 uh, kids all hop onto scooters, mm. and they head off towards Enceladus, and they're wearing what they call skin suits, which are very lightweight, lightweight um spacesuits hmm. i was i was really picturing the the suits that were kind of in oxygen with the um invisible helmets and mm -hmm. and all of that and it in kind of a nod to some of the the real science around it 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 takes them a good 24 hours mm. to to get from the wheel to enceladus because they have to take into account all the orbits and everything like that and just the the size of the saturn system mm. is is really really large compared to earth and the moon they head off towards the moon mm. and while that's happening all sorts of problems are happening mm. on the wheel where you have i want to say like three fatalities in a 24-hour period yeah. in in the mining so that that crisis is kind of ramping up and there's there's talk of gremlins or blue shadows mm. um on the moon that are causing some of this stuff. the doctor thinks that someone's kind of like hacking surveillance or kind of hiding and uh and uh, his his suspicion is falling on Florian. Why? <laughs> <laughs> it's fair to say as well, there, there's quite a lot of gaps in this book where, kind of like, as you're saying, where kind of, we skip like a day or so because um, um, whilst kind of waiting for uh, for science to happen, we get kind of like a discussions about the fishes and the gate and and um, the, the geezers, geezers. I'm never sure how to pronounce that word uh, on 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 Enchiladas. Uh, or in Enceladus. Enceladus. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay. And uh, S Sam uh, uh, says Kalbunga at one point, which um, <laughs> obviously that's something that the kids say in uh, whenever this is set. They do quite a bit of kind of like exploration of of the ice moon. I'm not going to dare to say its name. Uh, and uh, and then once everyone's set up camp, uh, Jamie asks Fee about the amulet. Uh, which takes us off on a bit of a, uh, a, a, an unexpected interlude. It does, yeah. Um, they kind of go through the history of the the amulet and how mm. it um, was picked up by a, a dinosaur, and the dinosaur um, <laughs> was destroyed or killed by a, I think, a meteor or something, and it became a fossilized mm. claw. Mm -hmm. And jumping forward to, I think it was eighteen ninety, and the yeah opening of the london underground and <laughs> yeah. that's where uh the the amulet first came into the possession of the um joe and fee's uh family mm. where it kind of was passed down from mother from uh mother to daughter yeah on their uh 16th birthday <laughs> and it uh it, just a random tradition and, and yeah. it kind of shows um we get little slices of like mm. 1890 and then 1930 and the first uh, transmission of television yes a black orchid reference because mm. well, um because it's not a tv they refer to it as a televisor uh from the john logie baird corporation uh and uh, apparently um, the next play that they're considering doing the bbc is black orchid uh so which should be uh, interesting uh also 1890 as well there's a um there's a tons of wing chiang uh, shout outs uh, is um, uh, Josephine Laws because all of these girls are called Joe or Josephine or some derivation thereof. Um, uh, the so the, the Victorian one uh, thinks that it's a fake made by Li Head Sen Chang, who mm. is one of the um, is the, the yeah from Talons of Long Chiang. Uh, also, she notices that every nine and a bit years it lights up like an Edison light bulb uh, briefly. Uh, and so, in the when, when we kind of move forward to um, to the time of uh, the moon landing, uh, we've got a sixteen year old Joss being kind of bored by all of the Apollo moon landing stuff, and and uh, her mum says that Unit have been looking into the fossil, mm -hmm. uh, and and then we have another curiously unspecified time period where uh, Joe Laws, presumably this. You know, the Joe Laws, who is the mayor, uh, is waiting to get into her dad's flying car. Was it a Volkswagen, a Volkswagen Dragonfly or something? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, and preparing to kind of go off to army training camp and then probably a tour of action in Venezuela. Uh, and uh, someone said, "Oh, watch out for the IEDs." There. Like, oh, 
Yeah, great, subtle. Um, but I'm wondering, when is this happening? <laughs> this bit with a flying car. Is it about? Yeah. Is it about now? Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it'll be around 2020 or so, I think is. When... Yeah, or earlier, possibly, yeah. or 2005. I kind of, given that we seem to be vaguely 30 or 35 year gaps. Uh, mm. So, uh, so which makes me kind of think. Well, this is a obviously this is set in the Doctor Who version of history. Uh, so, uh, yeah, which makes me think that the book is probably set in 2040 mm. or something. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. It, it's never specified. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, so in the Doctor Who universe, they have flying cars by now, and we don't. Sadness. We we sort of got that in. Uh... <laughs> Well, I was going to say uh, Enemy of the World, you had the... No, I think that might have just been a helicopter. Mm. Or, yeah. Or I'm thinking the hovercraft and that. Uh, yeah, because that's... Isn't that set in 2018, Enemy of the World? Yep. yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you mentioned the amulet glowing every mm. ni- nine years or so. That happens... Um, they've figured out that it happens three times a year based on Saturn's orbit, so... <laughs> Which seems like a random thing for them to yeah. figure out. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, uh, uh, they're saying, oh, there's a family legend that's got something to do with Saturn. It's like, no, it's a family crackpot theory that is actually quite correct, but there's no evidence. Mm-hmm. We do have a bit of jumping to conclusions in this book when the narrative suits it. We do, yeah. <laughs> quite a bit. So we after that story, so Jamie is camping out on an ice vent on Enceladus, and they've gone skiing and you know through the the cracks uh and stuff and Mm. there's um kind of a cool moment where and this is really happening so um cassini's uh the spacecraft we have in orbit around uh saturn right now Mm -hmm. was able to verify um that at the south pole of enceladus there is a liquid ocean which is frozen over and is venting um Mm. bits into space and unfortunately, they're camping on on one of these geysers. <laughs> yes. So you have this dramatic slow motion scene where the the ground around Fee is starting to swell up like a boil and is getting ready to burst. And mm. Jamie's running to save her in the low gravity. And right at you know he jumps right at right the right time and he grabs her out of the way and they go off spinning <laughs> and the geyser erupts and it starts snowing around them and it's kind of a cool sequence, mm. but. Um, their their little jaunt on uh on the moon is done and they do, they have to go back mm. to uh to the wheel um and that's where they learn that someone blew up a uh mining machine mm. which they think is an act of sab- sabotage or something like that and i should mention too that a lot of what happens in this book happens off screen yes. so we <laughs> we hear about these all these things happening but they're not ever told in the narrative. So in that sense, it very much felt like a like a 60s story where they get the phone call. Oh, such and such is under attack, you know, but we, we never um, we get the characters hearing about events or reacting to events. Yeah, um, which is kind of like shown quite well by the very next scene. We spent quite a bit of time talking about coffee at the Lord's residence. <laughs> and, uh, and so what's the. Master Doctor's kind of sorting out his his breakfast arrangements. Uh, Sonia then kind of comes in and shows on the equivalent of like an iPad that uh, this kind of this mining machine has been blown up over a new utility, and uh, and that the police are now uh, kettling the um, the residents of Res Free that suspect of being troublemakers. So uh, in other words, the kids, uh, and that includes the um, the returnees from the moon that's the name I can't pronounce. Um, but yeah, Kettling, is that a term that you'd encountered before? No, it it isn't. The kind of like a lockdown or isolation. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's um it, it it's a very kind of it was kind of coming into play around about the time that this book was being written. It's kind of like a police tactic of just basically kind of like surrounding and keeping people in an area um and uh, uh, which the which the police were doing for kind of like for protesters uh, sort of in various bits of, of of london yeah i don't know if they do it or it doesn't seem to get as much publicity as it did back then i don't 
really know too much about it anyway, anyway I won't get us into any trouble on that one uh but uh but yeah so there's quite a bit of kettling going on um yeah. and uh and we've yeah, and we've got people from the moon. Um, but uh, Jamie is released under basically some kind of like legal loophole because he's not um, known on the moon uh, on the wheel, pardon me. Uh, so, um, so therefore, the laws don't quite apply to him. Uh, and so, and he has a chat with the doctor and uh, and sort of mentions what he's learned about the amulet. Back on the wheel, <laughs> um, uh, Z- Zoe is. Uh finds out that Mac has saved uh, data about the rings of Saturn for quite some time, mm. as long as he was building the um, the wheel. So she goes back and starts searching for anomalies in the data, and I think eventually comes to the conclusion that the, the explosion that caused the ring systems is somehow connected to the, the moon that they're currently, or the mm. fragment of the moon that they're currently orbiting Mm. so there's some sort of connection there and then jamie as you mentioned he gets he gets freed through Mm -hmm. that legal (laughs) loophole yes and he um he tells the doctor fills the doctor in about the history of the amulet and the doctor remarks that it's a uh time lure and it's something that um is unethical and that time lords frown upon because you're potentially manipulating the history of an entire other planet mm. um to kind of suit your suit your needs and it, it seemed a little bit um hypocritical to me i guess because <laughs> <laughs> you see uh you see that happening and it's it's basically the bootstrap paradox right because mm. yeah you you have the the name of the co- the corporation even named uh bootstrap inc yeah. is kind of a not so subtle nod to that whole concept but it's the same sort of thing that we saw in uh, Blink, you know, with sending messages back to yourself, yeah. or uh, or River carving coordinates into a cliff face, mm. you know, getting the Doctor to appear at a time and place to rescue her. Yeah. Um. So it happened. Yeah. Also, recently, yeah, um, I'm not going to go too much into it and get the spoilers, but also this season of Doctor Who as well. There's, there's. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. There's an episode that uh, that wouldn't happen if it wasn't for something like that. That um, the Doctor causes <laughs> so uh, yeah yeah he's being hypocritical <laughs> yeah it's it seems a, a little bit weird to me too because i i think even without archive sending the amulet back in time mm. um saturn would have still been a draw i think for for humanity and it was and it was only this particular family that even did anything with the amulet to begin with mm. so the mining corporation all of that would have happened with or without archive sending the the amulet back in time so it, i tried not to think too much about that particular <laughs> pro- plot point <laughs> yeah yeah um we do get a couple of mentions too about uh the silurians mm. and how uh that was the uh they were the intelligence that was first sensed by archive and way back you know millions and millions of years ago and who knows if the ice warriors were sensed at some point as well. Essentially, the ice warriors get mentioned, but not, I think, but not quite in that contact. But yeah, so so the um, so the doctor's quite keen to kind of go and inspect this blown up um, mining vehicle, uh, and uh, whereas um, uh, Jamie wants to kind of look after the kids, so uh, he kind of sneaks back to kind of go and uh, join them. Uh, and when the Doctor and Zoe reached the wreck, uh, uh, Florian uh, Hart has uh, turned up uh, being a pantomime villain. And you also get um, Louis Ray uh, has appeared, and he's representing the rights of the AI in the machine, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, Louis Ray, he, he has an Isaac Asimov character vibe about him, I think. He, 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 does, he does feel like he's wandered in from an Isaac Asimov novel. Yeah, he, I was getting that and a little bit of Carl Sagan too, mm. just and how he would kind of stop and opine about <laughs> different things and and go off on little tangents. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, and uh, Fee uh, somehow or other breaks into the kettling round the back. How you do that with organized policing and stuff? Maybe it's not quite as well organized as it, is, but uh, as it was claimed. But uh, but yeah, so she managed to find a way to get in round the back. Uh, and uh, uh, as has Jamie, uh, uh, and she 
and and, and sort of they're all kind of like plotting a breakout, but uh, it doesn't seem too hard. If you can sneak into somewhere, you can probably sneak out fairly easily. I would have thought, but uh, hey ho! And in the wreck machine, uh, the doctor uh, finds the body of a blue doll, and it doesn't have any kind of like organs inside. It's all just entirely kind of plastic. Uh, and uh, the blue doll that was in the drill was shot by a blaster mm. and it and it was done as some sort of almost like a cover up yeah. where the explosion was was done to was kind of a, a secondary thing to yeah. to maybe deliberately take out the the mining equipment and to cover up some of the evidence that mm. was uh there and at that point Jamie and the 16 or so teenagers break out from the the quarantine section or the section that was on lockdown, and they mm. uh, all decide to head instead of Enceladus to uh, Titan. And they do this. They do this off screen. Um, yes. <laughs> it's like, this sounds like a cool scene, but oh, okay, we're not allowed to see it. Right? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, and uh, Florian is kind of uh, she, she's kind of having a row with Sonia about the most appropriate response because uh, I think Florian would be quite happy nuked a lot of them, and we then skip a day. Be because that's what the plot demands or something. Because by this point, everyone's heading down to the moon on a lift, um, sort of like the grown-ups. So um, we've got kind of Doctor, uh, Sonia, Florian, uh, Joe, and, uh, and and we then get quite a cool explanation about the gravity, about how as the moon, uh, as you kind of go through on the lift to the moon, the kind of the lift um, actually kind of flips round so that... Um, uh, uh, so that you don't arrive upside down, and uh, yeah, it's 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 quite a nice kind of cool sequence. And so we we, we then kind of once we once we're at the moon, um, sort of Sonia suddenly sees a, a doll and kind of shoots at it, uh, but the doll kind of um, sort of manages to escape, and the doctor kind of pursues it. And uh, Zoe and Simbad follow, and because the Doctor, whilst he's been running along through these kind of these these kind of like miney shaft things in the moon, um, the Doctor's managed to make chalk outlines of the arrows in which he's heading in, uh, whilst mm-hmm. whilst running, um, which I think that that. That takes a lot of coordination. Uh, I'm not too sure I could do that at the same time. Um, yeah. Then Zoe's realizing that, um, that the group is being kind of split up. Yes, it's just them two on their own, Zoe and Simba. And uh, they find themselves in a chamber of blue dolls, and all the blue dolls are dormant. Uh, but then they start to kind of like slowly waken. And uh, one touches Zoe, and then they start to try and kind of swarm all over her until kind of Sinbad drags her away. And uh, Sinbad then notices that they look an awful lot like Casey. And then they find uh, uh, they stumble across a larger chamber with kind of clumps of dolls all kind of huddled together. Uh, and it's described as being like bats roosting. Um, or tetraps. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yeah. Did I have to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All like tetraps. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, but uh, but yeah, and the doctor's here as well. Um, and so is the kind of like the laser lit doll, and the baby dolls are doing kind of like a almost like a morning ritual for the doll for for the one that's been been hit, and uh, then. The dolls start to turn, and they start to turn on Sinbad, uh, and uh, they're kind of like they're, they're just basically they've 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 surrounded him, um, and they're not touching him, but they're just kind of surrounded him. And then Florian Hart rocks up, uh, and uh, as is her way, she starts shooting things because that's what she does. Uh, and so um, the dolls suddenly now start attacking Sinbad. Uh, and Zoe and the Doctor manage to escape, but uh, as they're running past, Zoe sees Sinbad's skin starting to turn blue. Yeah, but he's kind of killed as or overrun as yeah. the yeah, and it gets infected. And I don't know if it turns him into a doll himself or he just dies with like partially converted over or what the deal is. But yeah, it's mm. it's really um, kind of a creepy scene. Yeah. And Zoe, as she was going in, she's kind of building a men- a three D mental map of mm. the interior of all the the mine, and it kind of saying it's kind of like Swiss cheese mm. in terms of. So she's she's able to lead the doctor out relatively quickly to to escape. At that point, we get 
we jump back to Titan, mm. um, which looks like get... Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Titan looks like Scotland, apparently. <laughs> We get Jamie, you know, descending through the clouds, and you get a lot of details about Titan's the only other place in the solar system where there's rain, for example. So we get, you know, the scene of rain happening, except mm. it's uh, like raining oil almost, mm. the kind of the hydrocarbons that are in the in the lakes and, yeah. and stuff in, on Titan, and uh, kind of goes into Jaws <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a little bit. And you have uh, a bunch of scooters kind of floating on top of some of the hydrocarbon lakes. And uh, you have this kind of a like oil shark that comes up and tries to start eating people. Uh, it, it does feel like a bit of a insert action sequence here. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's good. It's fun. I mean, JB kind of goes in and does a bit of uh, heroicness and sort of rescues um, uh, sort of uh, Dai and Sanjay, um, uh, who are kind of part of the, the rebel gang basically jamie's stuff is a series of disaster movies <laughs> i think that's about to say about his storyline yeah um so uh, yeah yeah so uh, keep an eye on them and uh, expect all your favorite disaster movie cliches to make appearances back on the uh the wheel the doctor and zoe managed to bring the body of the the blue doll that had done the uh or was involved in the sabotage or was shot at, at the drill they start doing an autopsy on the uh mm. on the alien they brought yeah out. um and also the doctor implies that he was at roswell um which makes me wonder how many versions of the doctor were at roswell because quite a f- yeah because yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the first time in his timeline i remember but i know subsequent ones have 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 been or have strongly hinted but uh but yeah we know that the uh, aliens in Roswell were the Tazoon Confederacy. Yes, yes, exactly. And so the, the doctors concluded that the dolls are modeled on the very first thing that they saw. So in other words, Casey. And there's quite a cool bit about how the interior of the dolls have been designed in a highly disputed way. So there's no equivalent of a heart or a brain or even blood supply, which is why they're so flexible and kind of like all the various bits can operate on their own, uh, which will become relevant later. I was picturing like blue tinted autons, really. Yeah, yeah. In terms yeah. of like being all plasticky and arms and limbs functioning on their own. But it, it's described in a better way with, with the distributed systems and everything. Because I, I have an IT background, uh, but it, it's a way that makes more sense than than I've ever seen with with the autons. Uh, is it, is um, Stephen Baxter approaches this from kind of like an engineering point of view, um, which I, I found quite interesting. Uh, though he does the doctor reckons that there must be like a central mind uh driving the dolls and uh, whilst he's right i don't quite understand how he jumps to that conclusion because surely if we've got distributed systems you could also have distributed intelligence uh or you could have each of them having their own separate inter- uh, yeah i'm not entirely sure but anyway uh so he reckons that they must kind of head on back to the moon to kind of go and do some more exploring and uh back on titan oh yes we get a, we get, we get a scene where uh <laughs> this, this. <they're... laughs> why did we do this okay sorry <laughs> well you know i'm sure stephen baxter wants to give us the full um you know uh yeah. kind of the Mar- the martian experience yeah with the, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah what came when, when when was the martian book published was it before this or not I think it was around the same yeah, time. Yeah, okay. So this might have just been two ideas that came. But basically, yeah. we've got some extreme recycling happening. Um, so a- as the book puts it, there's personal business goes into one end of the process. And we have biscuits and soup at the other. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, also, um, the colony has been named Tartarus, uh, which is kind of part of hell in uh, in, in Greek mythology. Uh, and uh, that's Sam's choice. And it said, that suggests that Sam's really intelligent uh, and is downplaying his, his seagrows. So, uh, but it also suggests he's a bit of a ridiculous show-off. Yeah, and uh, his colony is quickly going the way of Lord of the Flies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with uh the food processor breaking down and yeah. there's dissension and leadership challenges within the ranks and mm. his um position within the group is you know everyone's kind of realizing that this isn't a lot of fun especially when when their uh, recycling processor breaks down and then we cut back to the doctor and um a couple of others from the wheel 
going down yeah. or back down to do a second um, exhibition out on the the moon, and this time they're more they're more heavy, heavily armed too. Yeah. And um, at this point, we get the a nice little well, I don't know if it's nice, but we <laughs> we learn a little bit more about Florian's uh, past mm-hmm. and that her father invented the tea mat. Yes. And that's where the continuity era comes in for me with where this is set in season six, because mm. earlier in the um, book, they reference that the doctor is going to turn on the HADS soon, mm. the, the hostile action displacement system, Ooh, which we see. They don't name it. Mm, they yeah. don't call it HADS. Uh, it's implied it's the same thing, but he's got it offline for repair. Yeah, which makes me think that this is set just previous to the invasion. Mm. Um, but then we get the references to T-Mat mm. and the Ice Warriors, which would mean it was set after Seeds of Death. So I gave up trying to figure out <laughs> where in where in Series Six it's uh it's placed. And it's set it's set after the Mind Robber as well. Yes. So um, <clears throat> in my mind, I think this happens just before the Space Pirates. Yeah, I could see Essentially. that. Essentially, um, yeah. which uh, which which kind of gives some extra resonance to the last section um, of the book, but we'll mm-hmm. go into that later. Yeah, so so we've heard that, um, that that yeah, Florian came from riches, but then her dad became penniless because uh, T Rat has whoopsies. Zoe and the Doctor have kind of they've gone off, accompanied by two bootstrap guards, and uh, Zoe has got um, Mac to uh, start um, manipulating a flag. There's all these various kind of propaganda flags and she's kind of taken one down. And uh, and basically these are just very light screens that you can get to show the message that you, of your choice. And, uh, and for some reason it's sort of showing patterns for like the rings of Saturn. I'm not quite, I can't remember quite why she decides to go on that. It appears to be a bit of a random choice from memory, but one of the doll mimics it and sort of starts putting chalk on his chest. Uh, so sort of the chalk that the doctor left behind for the previous visit. And uh, some of the others have kind of got ring patterns scratched into their skin or they've painted on themselves using some kind of purple fluid and the fuse patterns are more spirally. It kind of feels very Maori, you know, sort of like New Zealand. Mm. It, it, it's, and uh, the doctor reckons that they're trying to cultivate their own consciousness. And yeah. uh, at this point, a different unmarked doll arrives, and he points at himself and points at the number, sort of makes it number one, signaling that he was the first doll. And we then see, well, I think it's one of my favourite sections of the book, which is the backstory of First, Mm. Um, and it starts off with it sort of suddenly feeling alive and just gaining consciousness. And then a doll appears next to him and wakes up. And uh, this second doll is kind of having a bit of a, a bit of a crisis. And the, so the first doll says, I am first and I will help you. Uh, and it's just trying to help. And there's a wall of light that appears saying welcome and then resilience, remember remembrance restoration and then i am archive and we then have a little jump forward and first is being sent on missions to kind of go and steal the technology of what we refer to as the others so in other words the humans and uh, he encounters a smaller other unarmed that calls it dolly uh, so casey mm-hmm. uh and uh, and then he returns to speak to Archive, um, who uh, tells first that he made him. And then and Archive's a bit of a downer. Uh, Archive comes out with this, this awful line of, the agony of self-knowing serves no purpose. Um, <laughs> Archive doesn't know how to motivate people. <laughs> it's a terrible boss. And uh, Archive kind of tells first to go and retrieve the lure and reminds first that uh, he serves not Archive, but serves the mission. We then have another check in with Archive and First immediately after the kind of like the moon shootout, and or shortly after the moon shootout. And uh, Archive is kind of like unsympathetic, saying that uh, I am a made thing, you are a made thing of a made thing, you are less than zero. We also get the hint that Archive is developing a new form of the dolls, um, one that'll be mm. bigger and stronger and, and able to. Uh, carry out its mission yes uh so so the dolls were really like version 1.0 yeah um, so we get a little hint of that yeah um and while that's happening we get word that throughout all this time florian hasn't shut down the drilling operation mm. and that's just been continuing all while well, all this has been happening yeah and it and it reaches the uh core of uh the moon mm. which causes a bit of a panic and 
all the dolls who they were just now starting to be able to communicate with yeah. um, leave the chamber and mm. there's kind of a rush for the exits. Yeah. And then we um, we cut back to uh, Titan mm. for, for more adventures with uh, <laughs> Jamie and the teens. Yes, yes. And, uh, Teen and this Titan. time... Teen Titan. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they should have... That's what they should have the called game. the book. They yeah. should have called the book Teen Titan. Yeah, that was... <laughs> DC would have sued, but it'd been great. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, so now it's uh, time for another disaster movie, and this yeah. time it's the the cryo volcano. So we yes. get uh, a giant volcano um, made of ice, which mm. is a thing on Titan. There, they, there are um, cryo volcanoes that have been um, found there, and rather than spewing lava, um, it's spewing ice from the mantle Mm -hmm. um because the temperature is like something like 200 below zero um ice very much has like the properties of rock on um on titan Mm -hmm. so we have this kind of liquid cryovolcano and uh sam so the eldest brother um the son of the mayor Mm -hmm. uh, his suit gets punctured by some of the ash that's getting spewed out from Mm -hmm. the volcano and there's lots of little pinpricks where his suit is able to retain its oxygen but the temperature level is fluctuating wildly um jamie is able to have contact with the doctor Mm. um through uh his headset throughout most of this and the doctor gives him a warning to uh basically submerge sam in something that's warm warmer Mm. than the surrounding air so his solution is to uh, to wait it out in the lava flow itself. Mm. So you have this imagery of uh, Jamie taking uh, Sam, who's pretty much unconscious by this point, and they descend into the uh, the lava, which is really ice lava, mm. um, and it's kind of like running water, but it's thicker and slower, kind of like molasses. Yeah, and um, Sam had a lifeline to uh louis the the planetary ethics guy Mm. um up on the wheel so they were able to dispatch a uh rescue ship to Mm. uh to to pick up the group on titan so they're uh kind of their rebellion their camping trip is over at this point back on the moon zoe and the doctor are kind of running as uh they realize that they're being kind of chased not by blue dolls but by blue soldiers uh, that are seemingly being based on Simbad, and uh, and then uh, just as they think that they're kind of done for, uh, Mac and Sonya's police troops uh, kind of like uh, uh, burst in through some ice walls, and uh, and and uh, the troops start kind of shooting at uh, at the blue soldiers, and it just ends up with these kind of disembodied body parts kind of going after them, like arms crawling along and headless corpses running towards them. And so the only thing that they can do is blow up the walls to uh, to block progress. And, and there's also a scene where uh, one of Sonia's marshals uh, sort of ends up um, sort of accidentally sort of sacrificing herself to kind of like save the doctor. Yeah, and 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 sort of Sonia sort of insists that the doctor remembers her name because uh, she was a volunteer. I mean that, that was that was quite a kind of good little moment. Uh, so and elsewhere on the moon, uh, we've got blue soldiers emerging from kind of every nook and cranny, and uh, they're starting to make for the cables. And Jamie and the rest of the those that were on Titan, uh, they're on a transport heading back to the wheel, and they they can look down at the moon and they can notice what appears to be like a blue stain yeah. spreading across the surface of the moon, but it's the blue soldiers. There are so many of them Mm. and they're kind of rushing up. I don't know if you listeners may have, um, some of the sequences in, um, what was that Brad Pitt zombie movie? Oh, what was, what was that? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of the, the, the images of the, the rush of people Mm. kind of creating almost like a mountain to, to reach out to, to try and, um, I got some of that same sort of imagery as they started, climbing the the cables to try and reach the the wheel of ice mm. um it's kind of a cool sequence yeah um and some of them make it up the elevator cables before mm. they're before they're cut um including one of the humans who got uh infected yeah simba <laughs> yeah. 
at this point too, there we get another one of those interludes where we kind of learn more about Archive. It's it's called Home, yeah. And it we learn that Archive was going to be like a art and science and culture repository, uh, searching for a world to recreate uh, the life you know of its makers on and it was equipped with like a uh, what they call a womb which mm. is kind of like a 3d printer <laughs> so the archives original purpose was to find a an empty planet and and basically recreate this lost society almost like a i want to say like a a disney super marionation sort of uh <laughs> automaton yeah. sort of world it was its original uh programming but it uh it got caught in the blast that destroyed the uh, mm. previous solar systems that it was a part of. And so it's programming was compromised and it got trapped in the, the core of the moon. And mm. we, so we, we get it a little bit more there. Mm. Um, and well, so all the cables have been cut. So the mm. wheel is kind of off on its, on its own. Now it's mm. no longer tethered to the, um, to the moon itself, but then you have a group of four. So the doctor, Zoe, uh, Fee, and uh, the security chief, uh, Sonia Mm. uh, Paley, uh, they head down in in a transport. Uh, And this part felt really realistic to me because they they stop for a moment um, when they come across some of the colonists that have been killed to um, remove their dog tags Mm. and to um, take skin samples for DNA identification. So they take a moment to do that and to honor... Uh, all the people that have kind of died mm. as as part of this and um at that point they encounter the the first mm. and they get and they give uh him the the amulet yeah. um so that part of the bootstrap paradox is completed and mm. they end up going deeper into the the nest of the the blue dolls really yes that that, that sounds like an awesome title for um that, that sounds like a better nest of the blue dolls that would also be a good title for this we also have um as well uh, the interesting revelation that said uh, the wheel recycle corpses you know when, when you die they still use your body but they're deciding for some of these infected bodies that yeah they're not going to take the risk right. we saw that in um smile this season mm. too that same concept of the recycling of the of the dead yeah um and florian's still around too mm. at this point and she decides to take a small team down to the surface um mm. louis decides to uh, accompany her mm. and uh she's going down um to the surface of the moon mm. with a bunch of the guards um from mm. her from the bootstrap corporation yeah and where she has an old uh missile on the <laughs> on the moon's surface yeah um and a kind of a nod to back to uh the 10th planet again yeah it's one of the uh the rockets from from that story mm. and it has the uh is it the the z bomb yes is that the yep. yeah yeah so the same uh kind of planet killing um weapon mm. that was is that how mondas was destroyed one of the i think so yes yeah yeah yeah. yeah. and also she's basically she's not quite forged paperwork but she's made we later learned that she's made the paperwork for this so loose and flexible because like she's ostensibly gone down there for site assessment for kind of like how much repairs need to be done (laughs) Um, but uh, yeah yeah florian knows how to play the rules or how to operate within not the spirit of the rules but sort of uh, follow them uh, in such a way that she can do what she wants to so the first is sort of leads the doctor to this kind of like basically this hoard of equipment uh, at first you kind of feel that it was, it was, it's like nesting where they've kind of stolen things from left right and center and then the doctor realizes that it's kind of like a garbled attempt at a time machine uh, using mirrors to send images faster than the speed of light tardis had probably detected a trial run and uh, and then the doctor starts thinking that uh, that this kind of time machine thing could possibly blow up saturn given how much damage was caused to the moon uh, yeah and we then go into uh, into a larger chamber and they see first communing with something shapeless and worn it's always hard to imagine a shapeless thing uh, but and signals start appearing on the flags and uh, and the doctor then starts handing out a shard of the tardis telepathic circuit he just keeps on him reasons 
Zoe then sees an image of an ark and an archive, uh, which makes the doctor guess that the name is Archive of a K, uh, which seems very convenient. Um, mm. And uh, and also, surely that kind of pun, for what sort of better word, uh, wouldn't necessarily work in uh, in Archive's own language. Yeah, that, that was a little. I I just uh, chalked that one up to the the TARDIS translation matrix. And... <laughs> Being cheesy, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the doctor is able to communicate with Archive, and he's confirms that it's very old, that it's in pain, mm. and that the level of information is just almost too much to uh, keep track of. And it's at this point that we start getting violent um, ice quakes yeah. happening throughout the the mining system, and mm. it's causing um, a lot of um, destabilization of yeah. of the mine. And mm -hmm. we also learn that. Um, Max memory of the Z bomb was erased. Mm. Um, Zoe's able to kind of help Mac figure out uh, how Florian could have had this kind of upper sleeve the whole time. Yeah. You know, just in case something went wrong with the colony. Mm. And mm. Um, the doctor kind of tricks Florian, who's, you know, on the surface now. There's a team led by Jamie, and they mm. have um, uh, weapons that have been kind of modified to only do a stun setting. Yeah. But as part of the reason for being able to communicate with Archive, they had to go through like a, like a liquid medium. So there was a scene earlier where Jamie is kind of melting a bunch of water above the chamber that they're in mm. and the doctor kind of tricks Florian and is able to get the ice water to dump on her and mm. en envelop her really. Um, and Jamie's also able to uh, shut down the, um, the Z bomb from going off with, you know, seconds to spare. Yeah. But... <laughs> blue wire, red wire, blue wire, red wire. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Oh, great. Uh, and uh, we also have dodgeball playing an unexpected part. Um, as um, Florian's guards are about to start shooting at them until um, they remember, some of them remember that they've uh, played dodgeball with Sam. And so the healing power of dodgeball um, stops uh, stops the violent shooter. <laughs> <laughs> and we do get the uh, doctor. Um... He, he was exposed to uh, the the vacuum of space for like 30 minutes or so, but he wasn't even blinded. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> His eyes shut throughout. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, then we cut to another council meeting, uh, this time discussing agenda items. Because, I mean, as we've learned from Star Wars, there's nothing more thrilling than trade agreements or discussions with agenda items. Uh, and uh, they've got now... This is the this is the meeting for the new council running um, um, the Wheel of Ice, and they've got representatives of all the classifications. The wheel is being rebuilt. Uh, yes, you may suspect that the whole host of scenes have been skipped. They haven't, um, but uh, and and there's a reference to an absent friend, and then the doctor comes in eating popcorn. Uh, uh, yeah okay and we're also told that the that the new colony is based on the robust british parliamentary system and the american principles of freedom 2011 different times <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah there's also uh, some kind of ethical fun about what they do with archive and uh, and then Mac decides he wants to go. <laughs> oh dear, how can I say this? He wants to go off and mine Uranus uh, and uh, oh, and help Archive get some terranium from there so that uh, she can go home. And Mac is then presented with some missing letters home from his mum. Um, yeah. And uh, and also, because when we were talking about the history of uh, of, of the stars, uh, it was being explained to, to Jamie, or maybe we skipped that bit, but anyway, so Jamie had a bit of a brief astronomy lesson um, sort of fairly early on in the book. And he was told that, um, that Uranus or Uranus um, the, had a, uh, it was originally going to be called after King George, uh, not the King George that he was fighting, but still a King George. And, uh, and, and he kind of got really upset about the idea that Mac was going to be going off um, around a planet that had at one point been named after an English king. Uh, and then, then they, the TARDIS crew decide to kind of just sort of leave them to it and kind of go off without any goodbyes because goodbyes lead to questions. 
And the uh, colonists end with a uh, freedom march that they do throughout the rebuilt wheel. And yep, then they, the TARDIS crew kind of nips off without any goodbyes. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's the that's the story. And the the book actually closes with the TARDIS crew with an alarm going off and Zoe seeing something shocking on the scanner, but we don't know what. So what's that going into? <laughs> and that was exactly how the uh, the book began too. With yeah the three of them kind of running from different places into mm. the console room. So it uh, yeah. kind of ended as it began. Yeah, I mean, I guess it implies that their adventures continue. It also implies they don't have a breather in between adventures. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, so maybe maybe she was so shocked because she realized they were about to do the Space Pirates. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So, yep. so what, what do you make of this then? <laughs> Um, uh, I actually liked this one, okay. um, a fair amount. I liked the, how it was kind of a little bit slower paced in mm-hmm. that it was kind of a slice of life sort of story where you, ha- you do have those kind of, I know last month I was like, well, why doesn't Barbara just stop and take in the moon? <laughs> and and oh, here we have, <laughs> there's a lot of taking of the moon, isn't there? <laughs> yes. And here we have the, uh, opposite end of that. <laughs> yeah. <where, laughs> They take everything in for quite a bit of time, and <laughs> maybe there's not quite as much um, plot. But you know, that's I I tend to those are the types of stories I tend to really enjoy. Are the I like the Star Trek novels where you it feels like you're living aboard the Enterprise sort of thing, and I get that kind of feeling a little bit here. I thought his uh, characterizations of the Doctor and Jamie and Zoe were all really spot on. I loved Zoe's uh, reactions to everything and how she was slightly annoyed mm. at, at, at you know it's it's that oh I, I really enjoy my iPhone sort of thing but now I'm back in a time when um, I have to deal with analog tapes and and that sort of yeah. you you get that kind of um, thing and I was also really glad that Mac ended up living because I was so convinced that um, Baxter was going to kill the robot mm. off in like a self-sacrifice type situation well i thought with some timey wiminess that mac was going to end up having been named after jamie so uh, no <laughs> so i was half expecting that there was going to be some mccrimmon connection but uh yeah well what did you think of this one? um yeah uh, <laughs> there were some <laughs> some points where i mean i i can see that he's kind of he, he's giving a sense of the world and everything but I, I did find it frustrating that there were quite a few interest or potentially interesting scenes happening kind of like off screen um Mm. i I was very glad for the blue dolls uh because i mean those were driving me through and i have to say there were some times where i found it a bit of a slog um Mm. because it did remind me and i've forgotten which one it was there was another baxter book that i read that i i remember just giving up on because i just found it such a slog um uh, because the for me the world does seem quite well put together, but then there's things like, oh, let's all go off skiing. And I'm like, hang on, if we're, if we're, if we're having this reinforcement of, of the kind of like, there's a rigid class system and it's all terrible and everything, but yeah, everyone can kind of go off um, to kind of go and hang out uh, on an ice moon. It, it, it does seem, yeah, I, I, I don't know. There, there did seem to be a little bit of kind of gaps because I mean, I, I was expecting it to be, at one point, I was expecting to kind of go down a kind of like a a grim political satire kind of thing. But yeah, I, 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 yeah, it, it was it was frustrating because because like the blue dolls are so good, they're so creepy, it, it's, it's fantastic, and also yeah, the science is is well thought out. But it's just I think a few of the characters, like for me, it doesn't feel like any of the characters are people. Mm. Really, I mean, that quite a lot of them are there to kind of spout out views. Um, especially Florian, um, but uh, but also um, yeah, Louis Ray's uh, and 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 also I thought it was a shame that kind of with the exception of Louis Ray's, the only sort of character of color and also the only gay character, uh, Simba gets killed off. Mm, yeah, the, the just, you know. which is a little bit un- unfortunate, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I. I Ugh, yeah, <laughs> I, I I wish that I could like it more. I think that's mm-hmm. the thing. So, yeah, I, I would agree with you that I think the characterization, I think it was 
a lot better for the main cast and i think mm. the guest cast was very much oh this this person fulfills this role this person's kind of like the quote unquote person from the ministry you know that's <laughs> you yeah. get quite a bit of that i did like how i felt the story was a little bit of a contrast of two different ais in mac and in archive mm. and how you had kind of different different outcomes based on how their programming was set up so i thought that was clever um you probably could have done a little bit more to pull that out into make it more um explicit of, yeah. yeah 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 um, yeah, because there's so many other things that are just being kind of like hammered home. Because I mean, because um, quite a few of the things are not particularly subtle about, like the class system and stuff, and and you kind of get the sense that that he thinks he might be kind of sort of dropping hints, but there's a few points where it's like, well, it's abundantly clear. <laughs> but uh, about things like the art, yeah, the artifact. I did notice how, especially in the early chapters, he put in a lot of different references, and that's where we get. I think a lot of the references to the different season six stories. Mm. And I felt that was him a little bit trying to establish his fan credentials yeah. up front. And that seemed a little obvious. And we even, you, we yeah. even get a reference to the Sunmakers. Mm, you, you don't yep. need to have a reference to the Sunmakers in this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, though, I, I think I, I can understand how you could fall into that trap as a recognized author to sort of say, look, yeah, I'm not doing this for a quick buck. I can't imagine that you make a quick buck for a Doctor Who book. Yeah, just show that yeah, he's a real fan. But uh, yeah. So how would you uh, rate this one then? Mm, uh, yeah, I have been... I, I, yeah. If it wasn't for the Blue Dolls and thing, I would, I would put it a bit good deal lower than what I am going to do. I am going to put it a very frustrated six. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because, um, I mean, there are some times where it... it yeah, we, we have so much of the kind of like the Basil exposition kind of stuff. <laughs> and just, mm -hmm. yeah, ah, oh, dear, dear. There's, there's a potential, there's a potential of, of a very good story in here, but it's not quite there. But anyway. Do you think it would make a good episode of the series or... Um or not that's fine no too. yeah i don't know i don't know if it would i don't think it would make a bad i think it'd be hard to do all the interludes mm -hmm. it, it'd be tricky to do all, all the, like the, the 1890s stuff and uh, all the other uh, and the scenes from archives point of view and also especially the scene from first's point of view i think that'd be very hard to do on the tv um i, I think it might make a better big finish play mm. yeah i can see that right. um yeah for, for me i was originally going to give this one a really, really high score but mm -hmm. I've since revised it slightly. <laughs> um, but I, I'm still going to give it, um, for me, it's an eight yeah. out of 10. Okay. Um, I thought it was, had a good balance of science mm -hmm. and storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and I really appreciated how the science was just spot on because that for me is a, um, can really take me out of the story. And you could tell that he, that Baxter follows the Cassini mission mm. maybe on Twitter, mm. you know, very closely because he was the references to um, bunch up points in the rings and the debris becoming, you know, several kilometers thick at different points and the spokes mm. in the rings. I mean, that's all true. All the details about Saturn or um, about a uh, Titan mm. and Enceladus minus the uh, sharks mm. uh, is, is all <laughs> is all true the sharks yeah. could be there we've just not they seen them be. yet yeah they yeah. could be yeah yeah, yeah. It, it could be one of these things that nasa's keeping secret from us yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i did dock at a few points partially because of the pacing it uh, seemed yeah. kind of languid and <laughs> and I, I like i said i like that kind of slice of life approach but even for me that felt a bit slow mm. um very 60s doctor who in that regard and dare i say maybe akin to the space pirates in terms of <laughs> <laughs> in terms of pacing um but i thought the characterization at least for the leads was really well done everyone had something to do and it mm. was well ba well balanced in that mm. respect um i also probably docked it a little bit just for the choice of story well so well i thought like the blue dolls and all of that was really creepy and effective mm. um I just think to myself, okay, you have all of time and space to play with, and you decide to go with a story about archive, you know, sending a 
necklace back to itself. It just, mm. I don't know that I would have told that sort of story, you know, maybe tell something a little bit more on the space opera side of things mm. with mm. the, the empire, the Federation, one of those types of things. But, um, yeah, I, I can't fault it too much, but yeah. it just, uh, it, it did hit quite a few of my sweet spots in terms mm. of things I'm interested in, but, um, the execution I think was a little, a little mm. off. I suddenly just remembered a bit that I hadn't spoken about, which was the Krakus bedtime story <laughs> that, oh. <laughs> that, that Zoe starts kind of reading at one point when she's trying to calm down Casey. Uh, so that, that's got nothing to do with anything that you've just been saying. But uh, but yeah, I was just, yeah, yeah, it's odd. And so Casey starts wearing a superhero cape. Um, I think that's kind of emblematic in a way, because uh, that feels such a shoehorn. Yeah, uh, just yeah, as you, as the point you were making about the continuity, to sort of say, look, I'm a fan. I've <laughs> I've seen the mind dropper. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's 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 fine. I mean, mm. there's 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 been other books where that you've liked more than I. Oh have. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I felt that you would have enjoyed this a lot more than I did. As a, as I was kind of thinking today, when I was kind of the grade, I thought, yeah, I was confident that you were going to rank this uh, a lot higher than I was. But that's great. That's good. Yep. We can have a conversation about it. It's cool. For sure. Cool. For sure. Yes. Uh, so let's. Anything else you want to say about the this one before we move on to listener mail and feedback? Mm, no, I think I think we're good. Um, so we don't have any emails this month, but we do have a few tweets to mention. Mm. Jeff on Twitter thanked us for the reminder to leave feedback on iTunes, mm-hmm. and he let us know that a review was uh, forthcoming. So cool. Thank you, Jeff, for that. Mm-hmm. We got another from Tarosia, who we got a email from in a previous episode. Mm. They mentioned that they had fond memories of the Face of the Enemy novel, enough that they wanted to uh, reread it before listening to our episode. Okay. <laughs> and they were hoping that it still holds up. And I think it does. I yes. Think that was a, that oh, was a yeah. great one. Definitely, definitely, definitely does. Definitely. And then we got a question from Nathan on Twitter asking us what our top three fandoms or interests were outside of Doctor Who. So I've had a bit of time to think about this, so I can, I'll answer first. Yeah, and, and you, you Chris, go maybe first, you can, yeah. Okay. Um, so my top fandoms outside of Doctor Who, I would have to say um, probably Mystery Science Theater 3000, um, both because of the local um, Minnesota connection and then just because it was a great show that I really enjoyed growing up. Mm. Um, probably Star Trek and probably i'd say the next gen and deep space nine um uh versions or the ones i'm closest to yeah and then for my third one um going way back uh probably masters of the universe i'm mm. a big uh he-man and she-ra fan okay. um and at in somewhere up there in the top are probably um farscape and uh the series v Mm. with uh the alien invaders i really enjoyed those uh, Mm. back in the day too but those are outside of doctor who i think those are the ones that are i'm most uh interested in Mm. for me i would say it's uh star trek but specifically ds9 which doesn't say that i didn't enjoy next gen uh, it is to say I didn't enjoy Voyager, <laughs> um, but uh, but maybe um, once I finish rewatching DS9, I think I'll give Voyager another try because uh, I, I I think that uh, I think that I'll probably kind of enjoy it more now, um, and uh, I am looking forward to Discovery uh, whenever that comes out, uh, the the new Star Trek series. Uh, the other ones uh, it would be kind of like. Um, the collected works of Joss Whedon. Uh, and, Good one. Yeah, and possibly, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a few things fighting for that kind of that third spot. I would probably say um, uh, Battlestar Galactica, apart from mm. the apart from the last few episodes, <laughs> which okay. I, which I like to pretend, especially the last episodes that didn't happen. That that's all just a fever dream. That 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 didn't happen. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 that that is how not to end the series. <laughs> <laughs> we we might have to disagree on that one because okay. I, I, I I did enjoy the ending. But, oh, okay. um, it did take me a while to come around to liking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
I, I was under the weather when I was watching it, so um, so I think I was sort of probably in the irritable moods as it was. Um, but uh, but some other things like when I was going, just going back to to the with with the vice, was whilst I was reading that, I was also reading Ready Player One, um, mm. um, which uh, I'm greatly enjoying, and I was enjoying that. S- a lot more than the Wheel of Ice, and so I was, uh, I was resenting the Wheel of Ice that I was having to because because of our schedules. I need to sort of make sure that I I carried yeah that, that I'd sort of finished reading it in time, and uh, and I wanted to go back to experience, um, you know, um Ready Player One, which is which is a fabulous book, uh, particularly if you like kind of um sort of like VR worlds and kind of computing and stuff. It's 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 great. And, uh, and that's being made into a movie by Steven Spielberg. I can't imagine how he's going to adapt it. I had kind of a similar ex- <laughs> experience where I was, um, I, well, I enjoyed The Wheel of Ice, I think, mm. you know, more than more than you did. Mm. Um, there there was another book series that I was kind of wanting to read, and, and your mention of um, Deep Space Nine made me think of it. Mm. Have you heard of uh, Star Trek Vanguard? at all Ooh, is that the peter david one or is it no um no it's uh yeah it's a it's peter david's is i think new frontier ah, okay, okay which is its own thing yeah but um vanguard was a series of books and i want to say there were maybe eight to ten in the series or so mm. um but it takes place so it's basically deep space nine the series mm. but if it but if it was set during the original series so oh. you have a a Federation space station at Starbase 47, also known as Vanguard. Mm. Um, and you, so you have all the events that, that happen over the three to five years of the original series play out. But during the same time, what would happen with all those events happening, like the Babel conference, all of mm. that, having it all grounded at, at a single space station. Mm. So um, it, mm. it was kind of... I've just started reading the, the series, but it's... um. It's set in that time period where you have a lot of like Daedalus class ships mm. and original series ships. So m- your mention of um, uh, Star Trek Discovery mm. made me made me think of that because it's kind of the same same the same concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. Oh, cool. Well, so getting back to Doctor Who, what yes. are we going to be doing? What are we going to be doing next month, Chris? So, uh, so next month, I uh, decided to kind of go into the magical world of new adventures and mm-hmm. uh, go for go for an author who is no stranger to the TV. <laughs> it says um, either in Doctor Who or in Sherlock. So, yeah, we are going to go for Saint Anthony's Fire um, by by popular demand. Uh, well. Two or three people, so that is popular demand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, so so it's, yeah, it's Mark Gavis's uh, Saint Anthony's Fire, um, which is 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 it should should be interesting because uh, that was his his second novel after the um, the the very successful and much loved uh, Nightshade. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it'd be it'd be it'd be interesting to see how that holds up. Um, and uh, also, if you happen to, because um, this, this is going to be this episode is kind of going to be hitting your feeds in sort of mid July. So the event that I'm going to describe may or may not have happened by this stage. But uh, uh, pretty much every year, uh, I go off to um, to the Latitude Festival, which is kind of like a smaller scale of kind of like Glastonbury, um, with kind of music, arts, poetry, and stuff. And uh, Fandy Newton was there last year, just as a as a punter. Uh, so you'll never know who you bump into. And if you were to go there, you may bump into me reading a copy of St. Anthony's Fire. Uh, so if if in between you're seeing somebody sitting up in the sands <laughs> reading St. Anthony's Fire. Do so come along and say hello. Um, and uh, it might be that this is the year that I decide each day to go as a different doctor. I have talked about doing that. Uh, though it's it's often more... Yeah, I've got a Tom Baker costume t-shirt, so I might possibly wear that. But anyway, enough wittering. It's St. Anthony's Fire. Enjoy. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and hopefully this will go better than the last time I had a physical book, uh, which I was reading, which um, was was Face of the Enemy, when I ended up having to dry it um, in the um, uh, in the bathroom of the local hospital because I just spilt water all over it. <laughs> so I prefer ebooks. Ebooks are easier. <laughs> you can't destroy them. 
and they're also yeah. they're also less valuable because yeah with this brexit economy i have to get my i have to fund my pension from somewhere um, <laughs> so, anyway yeah. Right. Well, until next month, <laughs> yeah. uh, I've been Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. Happy reading! Thank you for listening to the all-new Adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. You can contact the show and follow us on Twitter at ANDWBC Podcast. Our music is the Doctor Who theme, swing jazz version by George C. Music, used with attribution under Creative Commons license. Until next month, happy reading. Have you watched last night's Doctor Who? Yes. I just watched that this morning. What did you think of it? I really enjoyed it. I thought it was good. Yeah. My only slight criticism w- would be that we kind of saw Bill's storyline before with the whole Danny Pink thing. Uh, I feel like this season for Moffat has really been like his greatest hits album. Yeah. Where he's kind of returned to themes that have been proven popular and kind of done a new twist on them. Yeah. But uh, yeah, overall, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same, same here. I mean, I, I kind of hope that he finds a way to preserve Bill or, but um, though I, I like the idea that, um, that she and Heather might spend time in kind of like Cyberman heaven um that would be it that would be a nice ending I, I still can't quite believe that we're going to have regeneration next week either that or the christmas special but yeah, yeah i'm not sure how they're going to play that out I, mean, I know that they said that they're doing something different so i don't know quite what that means but didn't catch on that uh mr razor was the was john sim right away it didn't take me as long you know to a, where he pulled the mask off to figure it out but it yeah for a good 10 or 15 minutes i was like who is that guy yeah i, I was sitting there kind of thinking who's he he seems like a very good actor uh, I, I wish i saw him more he's got an interesting face and i can't remember what line it was that he said my wife suddenly shouted that's John Sim! I went, oh, of course it would be. <laughs> so I didn't figure it out. Yeah, um, same. But she's been she's been exposed to um, to enough kind of like bad eighties Anthony Ainley uh, type antics to be kind of like like yeah, there's a guy in a strange beard that we've not seen before. <laughs> He's probably the master in disguise. But I mean, they did a good job. I mean, he looked like an actual person, which is uh, more than um, often happened with uh, Anthony Ainley's disguises. Yeah, and it was nice to see that little character trait come back to yes. the whole disguise thing. Yeah, but quite why he's bothering, but hey-ho, hey-ho. <laughs> Thank you.